Thank you, uh, thank you, Richard and uh, and Mark. And it's uh, uh, it's a great it's a great opportunity to be in a, a room like this where I'm sure to crane my neck to see way up there in the top. It's a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful room, and it's a great opportunity. Any opportunity to talk about uh, some of the ideas that I've been spending the last dozen plus years uh, working on is uh, is certainly fun. But more important than that, I hope. Uh, I hope you find it uh, you find it helpful. You find it useful useful as well. Over the over these last dozen years or so, what I've done is uh, uh, I've kind of studied uh, leadership and strategy in the in the intersection of strategy and leadership together in a different way than how most people uh, have tended to do that. And what I've looked at is is things that go wrong, mistakes that happen. You may call it learning from worst practices rather than best practices. And uh, while we all know that there's, that there's a lot to be learned from. Uh, tremendous success stories. Uh, I think we also know intuitively that people want to learn from their mistakes. People sometimes, although not always, learn from their mistakes. And there's a lot to be learned from trying to understand all the things that might go wrong in organizations. And in this particular uh, uh, case, and what I want to talk about today, it's very much about decision making, uh, which is in some ways kind of the, uh, the heart of what uh, leadership and what organizational life is all about. Decisions that are good, decisions that are not so good, and why they, why they happen. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to, uh, uh, to go around the world really talking about some of these topics over the last years. And you know, wherever, wherever I go, people are always asking, well, why, why did they decide that? Why did they do that? These people are smart, they're talented, they're experienced. Why did they do what they did? And it, it kind of brought me back to the drawing board to try to get into the nuts and bolts of decision making. Um, and I want to start with one. Um, one quick story, one example of, uh, of decision making that might kind of set the table for uh, almost the roster of what might go wrong. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the story of uh, Iridium, um, uh, the Iridium company and the, the Iridium uh, mobile phone. Uh, I don't know whether anyone remembers this uh, story. It's actually back in the news today. The idea was that two people could communicate via mobile phone no matter where they were in the world. So you can be in Alaska. You can be in, um, uh, in Australia, and you can communicate via mobile phone because you're using satellites and not cell towers. And this idea was developed by Motorola in the late 1980s, a uh, pretty clever idea. Um, the decision in and of itself to start that business was not necessarily a bad idea, but over a short period of time, a variety of other decisions were made that ended up leading them down kind of a dangerous, a dangerous path. Perhaps you can, you can see one such example. If you look at the, um, if you can see the photo, uh, that is the smallest version of the phone they were ever able to manufacture. Um, it also is a phone that would not work in this room or any other room, in any city, in any place in the world, because actually you had to be outside with a direct line of sight to the, to the satellite. Um, and, and actually, in the earliest versions of this phone, if you remember those old World War II movies, you see the soldiers in the field with the transmitter packs. They ha you actually have to uh, unravel that transmitter pack, open it up, and point it up into the direction of the stars and get your connection. Uh, not quite the Blackberries and iPhones that we've all gotten used to today, but in its day, some potential. Uh, but perhaps the biggest problem here uh, in all of this development is illustrated by, by this quick anecdote where it turns out I was in, in Australia, of all places, and I was giving a speech talking about the Iridium phone as one of the examples. And uh, I'm talking, and then during Q&A, somebody raises their hand and says, you know, Professor, you have it all wrong. Me and my mates, we love the Iridium phone. So I ask him, well, sir, what, what do you do? And he says, I'm a ranger in the outback. Well, I could imagine how in the outback, something like a satellite-based phone might be useful. And then I asked him an important question. I asked him, how many mates are we really talking about? And he says, including me, yes, including you. And he said three. <laughs> and I said, that more or less accounts for the total market share they were ever able to achieve. Because for a very, uh, for a very small market segment, this was a blockbuster product. I mean, it's used today in Afghanistan. It's used in Iraq. It's used in oil drilling platforms. There are a few places in the world where this is a great, was and is a great product. But for the vast majority of the market, it can't possibly justify the literally five billion dollar capital cost. Because when you send satellites out into space, and I don't know whether any of you had such opportunities in your careers yet, but you write a lot of zeros behind that wire transfer. And it's not that you do this, you spend this five billion dollars all at once, you're actually making a series of decisions. And you keep on going and going despite all of these warning signs, 
despite all of these issues that are coming up. And so actually one of the things that you really discover when you start studying the, the iridiums of the world is that there are often all sorts of warning signs that are out there. Early warning signs about what might be going wrong and the decision makers that we're going to talk about to a large extent see those warning signs and plow right through it without any worry in the world. And as a result some bad things start to happen. The iridium phone and the iridium company actually went, went, uh, went out of business. Um, went bankrupt. Uh, it exists today, by the way, uh, because a group of um, private equity investors acquired all of the assets out of uh, bankruptcy court uh, for uh, one two hundredth on the dollar. So, you know, that's not a bad thing. You can imagine a capital cost of one two hundredth, perhaps justifying this, uh, this business. So, when, when you try to understand what did the leadership do at Iridium? Why did they keep on making these decisions? Why did they throw good money after bad, if you will? you start to ask some questions about, you know, how are their brains working? What kind of brains are we talking about? And it turns out their brains are the same as our brains because we know from a huge body of research in neuroscience a tremendous amount about how we are all wired in making decisions. It's really remarkable. Uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, the field of neuroscience has exploded in terms of the insights that have come out of that. And what we did is we went back to that research and we immersed ourselves there. And then we also studied cognitive psychology, another hot topic. And then what we did is we studied 80, over 80, strategic decisions uh, on, on our own. And we put all of that together to try to understand what happens in organizations and to try to understand, you know, what goes wrong and, and why. And some of the questions that we've tried to uh, uh, answer and that I think we can gain some insight into when we take this lens of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and decision making, are fundamental questions that have been in the newspapers for, uh, uh, for, for a year and counting. Uh, why did Dick Fold refuse to sell Lehman Brothers until it was really too late? And it was actually just September 13th and 14th of last year when Lehman went out of business. Very, very fresh. Um, why did Ken Lewis of Bank of America dramatically overpay for Merrill Lynch? And the price is still being paid in a variety of ways, including Ken Lewis's own job. Uh, why did so many smart people invest with Bernie Madoff? Why did they do that? Why was the federal government response to Hurricane Katrina so, so slow? And I'm going to talk about Hurricane Katrina in a little bit more detail uh, as, we, as we go along. Uh, why are 100-year-old newspapers going out of business? This one really, really gets me. Why, why so many tremendous newspapers have been around forever? Why are they going out of business? And one clue to that, by the way, is when you blame your customer for the reasons why you're not doing well, it's probably a bad sign, and that's what they're doing. Uh, they're blaming their customer because people don't want to buy a newspaper. They want, to, they want to get their news in a variety of other ways, and that's the customer's fault by definition. Anyone who's in business who blames their customer knows that's not a defensible or sustainable approach, is it? Why did so many bankers keep doubling down with subprime? A big question that's still being asked by a lot of people. But really, if you put it all together, why do good leaders make bad decisions? I mean, that's the summary question, and that's the question in many ways that has driven a lot of my work over the last dozen years to try to understand why does that happen. And as I mentioned, the answers in many ways are encapsulated by our brains. Our brains are wired for action. We know this, again, from tremendous amount of research, and there's two things that I want to, um, I want to highlight about, about this. Number one is what I call one plan at a time. Think about how um, maybe you learn this at Simon, maybe you know this from your, from your careers. Uh, how do people make decisions? What is a, quote, rational decision-making process? Well, we might say that we'll identify um, a goal or, uh, or some challenges or opportunities. Uh, we'll go collect some data, think about this a little bit, and then we're going to uh, identify a set of alternatives. And then we'll evaluate those alternatives, pros, cons, costs, benefits, and then we'll come up with the best solution, the optimal solution. That's kind of your rational decision-making model. The truth of the matter is, hardly anyone ever does that, even when you think you're doing it. More often than not, we have this one plan at a time in our heads. That one plan at a time basically is the solution. We know where we're going. We know what it is we want to, uh, we want to have as our answer, and we will get ourselves there in a variety of ways. A number of people in business schools, such as this one and my own, go into consulting. Well, consulting is a great business because CEOs are hiring you to justify the decision they had in mind ahead of time. 
and you are providing the official justification guidance. Those are very good business because our brains work this way and it's not about to change. We are wired for action, for quick, uh, for quick action, for this one plan at a time. And actually, if you think about this, if our ancestors saw this uh, tall striped animal bounding towards us in the tall grass and they formed a committee to talk it over, what do you think happened? They weren't around to pass their genes on to all of us. And so there was a tremendous premium on making quick decisions, on coming up with a solution to a problem, on identifying this one plan at a time. It made a lot of sense in a much simpler world. We are, of course, living in a little bit more complex world than that. And sometimes we still fall into the same traps. Second point, emotional tagging. I have found, really, as I've gotten into this and talked to a lot of people, um, really been struck by how powerful emotions are in decision making. Uh, now, that shouldn't surprise anyone. If we just take pause of our own lives for a second, we all can imagine plenty of examples when emotions drove us to do something in a particular way. But the way I have this in mind, what I want, kind of the visual I want you to think about is you have a decision situation, you're looking for how to deal with it, and in your brains, we all have a file cabinet with different folders. Some of those folders have big red writing on there with, with, with a skull and crossbones, which is to say, don't do that. And we're not going to take that folder out of the file cabinet of our brains because the last time we did that, our boss never let us forget it or we lost a job or we lost a contract or we didn't get the sale. But there are other folders in our brains that have nice happy faces around them and we're going to go towards those folders to come up with the solutions to problems time and time again because that got us to the winner's circle before. And that's why in many instances, people tend to keep on doing the stuff that got them successful in the past. We, can't, we tend to keep on doing those things that got us to the winner's circle. It's human nature, after all. It's how our brains are, are wired. Our brains are wired for action, quick planning, one plan at a time, not this kind of complicated decision-making model, and the power of, 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 of emotions. Uh, emotions playing a big, big role. Uh, if some of this sounds somewhat related to some other things you may have heard of, I want to make that connection explicit. How many of you have read the book Blink? Seeing about a third, a quarter of the hands going up. Blink is a, a great book by Malcolm Gladwell. It was published a few years ago. And the thesis of Blink is, is straightforward, right? The thesis is people make quick decisions and often it works. And Blink, if you're not familiar with the book, referred specifically to intuition, quick decision making, straight from the gut, to use the Jack Welch uh, term. Uh, uh, Blink means people often make these quick decisions, not with long analysis. They rely on intuition, they rely on their gut, and it works. But actually, if you read, if you read Blink carefully, what you discover is, yes, there's a lot of examples from different walks of life where this quick decision making was, was pretty good, but there's also a bunch of other examples where it actually led to disaster. I mean, there's the example of, of the cops in New York shooting an unarmed unarmed man one evening because they made assumptions about who he was and where he was coming from. So there are a lot of other examples in Blink where, le where, where relying on this kind of quick decision making, this intuition, actually leads to disaster. So a pretty important question arises, right? When is it a good idea and when is it not a good idea? And that's the frame I want to use in describing some of the key lessons and some of the key findings from this work for all of you today. Uh, in many ways, what we're trying to answer is under what conditions is blink, intuition, straight from the gut, really a good idea, more likely to lead to successful results, and under what conditions do you need to uh, think again, if you will, take a step back and be more analytical, collect more data, be, uh, 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 monitor that decision more carefully, provide additional oversight, or anything else that's kind of part of our management, um, management toolkit. That's really the question we're we're trying to answer. Let me, uh, uh, and the way I'm going to try to answer the question is by really telling you a bunch of additional stories that will illustrate the different ins and outs of these, of these ideas. Uh, and the first, the first of these is, uh, is one that's uh, gotten pretty famous in the last, uh, last year or so. Do you remember Captain Chesley Sullenberger? Sully, for those of us who are pals. I never met him, but uh, uh, if you recall, Captain Chesley Sullenberger is the, is the pilot of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, 
and it takes off from LaGuardia Airport. No sooner does it start to go up when a flock of birds, it runs into a flock of birds that incapacitate both engines. Not a good situation. The captain, Sullenberger, decides instantly, comes up with one plan at a time, right? And that one plan at a time is, let us turn around and return that aircraft to LaGuardia as fast as possible. Uh, notice that he doesn't have a long debate with his co-pilot. Uh, he doesn't form a committee. Uh, he doesn't call the CEO and head office. He doesn't ask the passengers in the back of the plane. He knows what he needs to do and he does it. He has a one plan at a time. He immediately relies on that quick decision making. And you know, this photo shows the aircraft returning. That's the Hudson River. Um, on the right of the craft is New Jersey, on the left is New York City, is Manhattan. Um, and if you remember the story well, you'll know that that's not at all the end of the story because as he turns around and starts to go back over the George Washington Bridge heading south again, he realizes that his one planet at a time is actually not the right one planet at a time. He makes a change to it. And actually, it's another instantaneous change. He comes up with a completely different one planet at a time. And that different one planet at a time was Let's land the aircraft at Teterboro Airport in New Jersey. Why Teterboro? Because that is closer than LaGuardia, and that's what he decides. So in, again, no long discussions with the co-pilot, no big committee discussion, no going through long checklists, no calling the CEO and head office, and not asking any of those passengers what they might think about that, which is probably a good thing. And so uh, another one plan at a time. And then, you know, another remarkable thing happens. That one plan at a time gets blown up. Well, maybe not the right terminology in this example, but uh, that one plan at a time goes by the wayside. I was going to say sinks like a ship, but that's not good either. Uh, uh, and he comes up with another one plan at a time. And do you remember this? Here's the uh, transcript. I'll read it to you in case it's a little tough to see. This is uh, between Captain Sullenberger and uh, the air traffic control. Air traffic control says, uh, we can clear you to land on runway one at Teterboro. Sullenberger says, we can't do it. OK, which runway would you like at Teterboro? Uh, Sullenberger says, we're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again? <laughs> Instantly, Captain Sullenberger comes up with a third one plan at a time, this time deciding to try to land the aircraft on the Hudson River as opposed to landing in Teterboro. And as we know, the gods were looking favorably that day, and, and the aircraft uh, miraculously landed and everyone, everyone survived with no, no serious injuries. Um, but notice, all of this is less than two minutes. Two minutes time from beginning to end. And what happens in the two minutes? Three completely different one plans at a time. And that's how so many people think. And I'm going to say in this situation, well, of course it was a great success. One plan at a time made perfect sense. And why is that? Because of experience. Experience. Let us look at the experience of Captain Sullenberger. Number one, he was, of course, an experienced pilot. Number two, he was an experienced accident investigator. And number three, to cap it all off, he was an experienced, a certified glider pilot. So I don't know about you, but this is the guy that I'd want flying the craft if I was in that situation. Uh, you can't get any better experience, right? You have a situation here that is a virtually perfect match between the challenge that's being faced and the experience base of the key decision maker. And the question to consider is how often is that the case in business? How often is that the case in our business lives? And I'd venture to say that it's actually not as common as we might think. Because when you have this perfect match, everything goes great. Don't waste time. Intuition, gut instinct. But when you don't have that perfect match and you still rely on that gut instinct, it, it can get very complicated. Let me say something about different types of experience really quickly. So there's kind of three simple examples that you can imagine. Example one is what we just talked about. Perfect match, right, between experience and context. Another example, second example, would be the opposite, which is the situation you're in is completely different than your experience base. Well, what would you do in that situation? Most leaders, most decision makers will realize they can't figure it all out themselves. It is so different than what they've done before. And in a, in a sense, it's actually easier to deal with because you'll bring in experts. You'll bring in advisors. You'll monitor it more closely. You'll spend more time analyzing it. You'll collect more data. So in a way, the, the, the situations that are far off from your experience base, they're not as big a problem for most people. The biggest problem occurs 
when you have a situation where your experience base is close, but not close enough. It's close to the situation you're dealing with, but it's actually a little bit, a little bit off, dangerously off. And when that happens, some bad outcomes can occur. And let me illustrate uh, one such bad outcome from one year ago in Lehman Brothers. If you recall, Dick Fold was the CEO of Lehman, and um, um, he took, as the leader of Lehman, a stance that said, we will try to retain the independence of Lehman for as long as possible. We are not looking to sell this company. We want to retain our independence. That was his strategy. Uh, until it got really late in the game and he did start to look for a partner and it turned out to be a little bit, a little bit too late. Uh, so his stance was independence. Why was that? Well, you know, these, uh, these, these examples, these stories are always more complex than, than I could share in the space of a couple minute example. But here's a big part of it, I think. If you remember 10 years ago, actually 1998, long-term capital management, the, the big hedge fund, the Nobel Prize winning um, uh, experts created this hedge fund that blew up. Uh, Long-term capital management had leverage of something like 100 to 1. So it was a very high risk hedge fund investment. And two things happened in 1998 that were not part of the, um, part of the model at all. The two things, as it turns out, were the Russians defaulted on their bonds and the mortgage-backed securities markets collapsed. Both happened, zero probability, LTCM blew apart. And a lot of companies, a lot of firms had, um, had counterparty um, um, debts and relationships with LTCM, including Lehman Brothers. And so what Dick Fold did is he fought through that. He, was he became a legend within Lehman because what he did is he, he, he enabled Lehman to retain their independence, not fall prey to the LTCM disaster, and keep on going. And fast forward to 2008, last year, and what does Dick Fold do when there's another financial crisis? He actually goes around to Lehman offices around the country and he says, we got through LTCM and we're going to get through this. I mean, he, he said exactly that. We got through LTCM and we're, going to, uh, and we're going to get through this one. He took his experience from 10 years earlier and applied it to a situation that almost everybody, especially by August and September of last year would say was dramatically different than anything that was going on 10 years earlier. I mean, LTCM problem, that was a big financial crisis and was a serious thing. But the global financial crisis and the depth of that financial crisis last year was, a, was, was something of, of fundamentally more complex and more, more difficult. So is experience a good thing? Well, you know, it's a, tough, it's a tough pill to take because the implication here is that your experience as a manager, as a leader, could be good, but it could also cut both ways and can hurt you. It could be dangerous. And, and, and why is that a tough pill to take? Because if we think about our experience as leaders, as managers, as executives, that's our currency. I mean, that's, those are things we, 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 write, we, we write that down all the time. We call those things, you know, resumes. We, we, we're proud of all those things. And it's possible that, that that experience base may lead you down the wrong track may lead you down the wrong track. Lots of other examples, and I'm happy to share more of these uh, later uh, if, if you're interested. But just in the interest of, of time, let me kind of put together the whole story, let you see exactly what the punchline is, and then delve into it in a little bit more detail. Remember, the question that we're asking is, under what conditions, under what situations, does it make sense to rely on your gut instinct, your intuition, your one plan at a time, such as Captain Sullenberger, and under what circumstances does it make sense to take that step back, to think again, and to be more analytical and more careful? And the answer that we found from this research are these four red flags in decision making. And when any one of these four red flags are in place, it is very dangerous to rely on gut instinct and intuition because that is more likely to lead us astray. We've, al we've already talked about the first one. Are your personal experiences misleading you? Are your personal experiences taking you down the wrong path? That's kind of the Dick Fold example, right? Uh, but there are three others, uh, and just to uh, introduce them to you for a moment, is your personal self-interest clouding your thinking? That's got to sound obvious to everybody. I mean, self-interest is always part of our thinking. Well, the answer is yes, but what we, do, what we know is that self-interest is even more powerful than we probably think, and I'll illustrate what I mean about that in a moment. Third question. Have you made a dangerous prejudgment that locks you into place? 
Prejudgment basically means you decide the world is the way it is without getting much of the data. You've just decided the answer, and no matter what happens, you stick with it. And then fourth are inappropriate attachments. This is attachments to people, to places, and to things. Are they pushing you in the wrong direction? So again, we've talked about the experience question, the experience red flag. Let me give you a couple of examples of the other three so you understand how they play out and what to look for in your own, in your own businesses and your own careers. Let's start with this self-interest. Self Again, self-interest, no, not a surprise to anyone. I mean, we're talking about you know, how, our, how have our brains evolved. It's evolution. Of course, it's all about survival. It's all about survival of the fittest. We understand that. Why would we be surprised that people rely on their own personal self-interest to make decisions? Of course we do. Um, but I'm not even going to talk about the blatant, obvious turf battles that sometimes you see in organizations and you know, people trying to get credit for other people's ideas and all these kind of petty things that happen. I'm going to talk about something even more fundamental. And, and that is that self-interest actually takes place, actually um, occurs often at a subconscious level so that we don't even know we're acting in that way all the time. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, it's actually an amazing example if you think about this. Um, there were a group of uh, accountants um, from one of the big four, is it four or three or five? I lost track. Um, on the way down to two, probably. Uh, a group of, of experienced accountants came back to a business school to do an executive training exercise. They spent a week, actually, in the business school to do different uh, exercises, uh, different executive development um, 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 activities. And one activity they did was a forensic accounting study. So they were all given, everyone, all these accounts were given a case study. It was a doctored up case, not, not a real company, but they had finan the financial statements were there. And, um, uh, and they were told, your assignment in your groups is to analyze these financial statements and identify all the red flags you see, whether it's about disclosure, whether it's about potential misstatements or, 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 or selection of accounting treatments or whatever it happens to be. Put on your forensic accounting hat and identify all the issues, all the question marks, all the problems you can. That was the assignment. Everybody had the same case. However, one half of the group was told one more thing. And they were told, we have an opportunity to do some follow-on work with this client. That was the only other thing they were told. They all go off to their, to their study groups. They evaluate this. They think this through. They come back. They present. And you know, what do you think happens? The group that was told, we have an opportunity to do some follow-on work, actually identifies fewer, significantly fewer, accounting issues, and mistakes, and red flags than the group that was not given that one additional statement, that one additional point. Now let's put this into perspective for a minute. Is there any follow-on work in this particular situation? We're in the classroom. We're, in a, we're talking about a fake company with doctored up financial statements. There is no real company. There is no follow-on work. There is no real money on the table. None of that is true. Yet, and of course, these are smart, experienced people. They knew that. Yet they still behaved in a way that suggests that their brains were processing this information clearly at a subconscious level. There's no way they, they were doing this on purpose. They knew there was no money on the table for them. They knew there was no follow-on work. There was the subconscious operating. And it's really remarkable. In fact. Uh, when these results were shared, the whole class grinds to a halt, because you know what happens? This group that found fewer mistakes, they refused to believe that they had the same case study as the rest of the class. And they go across the class and they grab the case study and they start flipping through it to make sure it's the same financial statements. They couldn't believe it. I mean, that's something amazing, isn't it? I mean, that, that tells you the power of self-interest. Of, of self and you know, I think this has something to do with what we've seen on Wall Street for the last few years, and actually with a very short blip coming right back to a bonus near you very soon. Uh, and it is this, I'm going to call it a sense of entitlement. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful thing. Um, one example, probably an unfair one, because this is John Thane, who I think, uh, I, I think very highly of, uh, experienced a senior executive of Goldman Sachs. Uh, ran the New York Stock Exchange. He became the CEO of Merrill Lynch. Um, extremely smart, extremely talented person. But you know, he got in the news in a, in a pretty bad way during the TARP funding time. 
And, and that was because he spent, you know, um, um, I don't know, a million dollars or some crazy number uh, to redecorate his office. Now, let's think about it for a moment. Does anyone really believe that John Thane sat around a, a conference table with his advisors and with his team and said, let's look for a way to spend as much money as we can on office furnishings so that we can have the worst possible visibility at precisely the time the government is giving us the start money? It's not possible. In fact, he probably didn't even know a lot of the details of this. He delegated it to his team, who of course assumed that he would want all of this, because that's that sense of entitlement that's, that's in place. Uh, and some of these items, you know, the $87,000 for a pair of guest chairs, and actually $87,000 for an area rug. I think it was kind of one of these dollar stores, except it was $87,000 store, uh, <laughs> all the same price. Um, but no, no one can believe that this is, you know, um, um, that, that this is, this is consciously done. I'll give you another quick example. Um, uh, probably like, uh, like at Simon, at, at Tuck, uh, we have a number of students who go to Wall Street. And um, last year I was, uh, I was in New York and I was having a cup of coffee with a student that just graduated not long before. And we're talking about the financial crisis and bonuses and uh, how everything was being reined in. And, uh, and he argued with me for, for half an hour saying, uh, if, his, if his group, or a group he was part of within this major Wall Street firm, if they did well, why shouldn't they get the full bonus, regardless of the fact that the rest of the business didn't do well and the government was putting in 20 and 30 billion dollars in the business? Uh, it was incomprehensible to him, and this is after just a period of months in this firm, that there was anything wrong with that idea. Most people on Main Street, let alone almost any street, will say, well, we understand the logic of paying someone for doing a good job, but there is a bigger picture here of an overall organization, and especially if the government is putting in tens of billions of dollars. It's a very, very hard argument to make. So to me, there's a, there's a sense of entitlement that's there. But maybe the most important thing to take away from that is how pervasive and maybe even unknown this role of self-interest is. We don't know we're behaving in this way oftentimes because, again, operates at a subconscious level. And we'll talk about what to do about that afterwards as well. Third. Question, third issue, third red flag, misleading, misleading prejudgments. And maybe this is another one of those unfair ones. That's Rick Wagoner from, from GM. And probably it's unfair to put him up there because the reality is that there's 25 years worth of executive leadership at GM that got them into the trouble that they ended up with, uh, ended up in. And it's not just Rick, Rick Wagoner. Uh, but let me just hi highlight briefly what I mean by prejudgments. And if we really think about this, not just in business, but in our personal lives, we'll probably have lots of examples. Um, a prejudgment occurs when we decide the world is the way it is. We've come up with a solution. We've come up with an idea. And what we do is we seek out data that is confirming, that is consistent with what we want to do, and we discount or avoid the data that suggests we're going in the wrong direction. We do this, we do this all the time. In a sense, it's almost like cooking the books. And I'll give you a very simple, personal example. It goes back a few years. But as I think about it in retrospect, it was actually exactly a, you know, a good example of this. You know, it goes back to when I was just um, deciding what I wanted to do uh, in, in my career and what, what, uh, what graduate school to go to, et cetera. And so I had, you know, I had four or five choices. Law school, I had no, no clue at all. Law school, business school, MBA program, PhD program, a couple other options, different countries. And, um, so you know, I, was, I figured I'm a smart guy. I'm going to be really analytical about this. And what I did is I wrote down the five choices. Down, down the side, and then I identified the criteria that were important figuring this out. You know, um, prestige of the school, uh, career opportunities, location, what, whatever they were. And I had those arrayed at the top. And I created this beautiful little grid. And I put in these numbers. And I added it all up. And it came up with an answer that I actually didn't like. Um, because it said, go to, this, go to school X. And I didn't really want to go to school X, I discovered after doing that. And so what did I do? I decided, well, I don't have all the right criteria. I need to change some of those criteria. And when I did it again, it didn't come out the way I wanted. And then I realized, well, I haven't been weighting the criteria properly. Right? And eventually, I got to do what I wanted to do because I cooked the books to get there. Um, you know, uh, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted to do. And I developed this so-called sophisticated analytical apparatus to try to get me there, to make me feel like I was doing something in a, in a rational way. I looked for, in that case, I created confirming data. I didn't just look for it. I created the confirming data. 
Finally, inappropriate attachments. Do uh, you know who this is? Jerry Yang. That's Jerry Yang, former um, uh, CEO of uh, Yahoo. He is the uh, founder, was and is the founder of uh, Yahoo. He's on the board of directors. Uh, very talented uh, person, obviously, in his career and what he's done. Uh, and I'm thinking here of, a, of a, an example of an attachment. In this case, remember, an attachment is to a person or a place or a thing. In this case, to his own company. And uh, if you recall, over a year ago, Microsoft made an, a, uh, an unsolicited offer for, uh, for Yahoo. And this got a lot of publicity, of course. And if you remember, Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, made an offer for Yahoo. And um, Jerry Yang and the board, the CEO and the board, said, no, that offer is not good enough, which is fine, you know, negotiating ploy or whatever. Um, and so actually, Microsoft raised the offer. And the board says, the Yahoo board says, no, that's not close to what we think we're worth. OK, I could see that too, perhaps. Uh, Microsoft comes back with a third and now final offer. And the board deliberates and decides this is just not good enough. We're not going to stick to, we're not going to accept this offer. Now, if you look at the difference in market value between what that Microsoft offer valuation was for Yahoo and what the Yahoo stock valuation was afterward, the difference was actually $30 billion. I mean, that's a B. That's the big letter, not the M. It's the big one. $30 billion. Is it possible that in conducting their due diligence on the board of directors at Yahoo, they believe that they can come up with a value-creating strategy that would generate $30 billion in value for shareholders? And by the way, that's $30 billion present value dollars, because that was coming right away. That wasn't over the course of 10 years or five years of strategizing. I'm not going to say you know, that there wasn't such a thing. I, I don't know. I wasn't on the board. But boy, that's a tough one to imagine. I have a simpler explanation. And the simpler explanation is that Jerry Yang as the founder, but also you know, as the CEO, didn't want to sell that company. And not only did he have this attachment, and an and, and, and understandable attachment to Yahoo. Founders and creators of businesses have and should feel that attachment to, to a company. But also a negative attachment, I think, to Microsoft. Because you know, imagine um, Jerry Yang sitting around a, sitting around a Starbucks in uh, in Silicon Valley and grabbing a you know a double espresso with uh, with Sergey Brin from Google and Steve Jobs walks in. Hey guys, what's going on? And Jerry Yang has to say, Well, I just sold the business to Microsoft. That won't be a happy conversation, because Microsoft <laughs> is the evil empire in Silicon Valley. So not only do you not want to sell your own business, you don't want to sell it to of all companies Microsoft. Now. I'm not in Jerry Yang's head, of course. I was not on the board of directors. I don't know if any of this really happened. But I think it's, a, it's certainly easy to see how this played a role in this entire process. So inappropriate attachments. And it's a dangerous one. It's a scary one. Because um, as, you, as you think about attachments, I mean, it's kind of what makes the world go round. It's about our relationships. It's about the people we care for and we love. It's about friends. It's about organizations that we've built, companies that we've built, all great, great things. But sometimes it blinds us to, to making decisions that, are, that, uh, that might not be the right types of, right types of decisions. Um, let me kind of put together all of these ideas with one final example. I mentioned I would, uh, um, I would talk about um, uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, which is something we studied in depth in this, uh, in this book. Um, and that's the example I have, I have in mind. Um, and uh, uh, I want to I show you who was in charge. Oh, sorry, I left out <laughs> one little thing here. I guess everybody knows who that is. That's Bernie Madoff. I mean, talk about a great name for somebody who's a Ponzi schemer, Madoff. Um, I forgot, I forgot about this. It's maybe because I want to forget about it. But the reality is, you know, every, almost every Ponzi schemer is the same formula, which is you insinuate yourself into a community, you build trust with that community, people believe in you, and you start to just do things that maybe you shouldn't. In fact, you know, if, if you went through the list of investors uh, with Bernie Madoff, the, um, I think New York Times published a list of some, some of those investors. And there were people from J.P. Morgan, there were people from Morgan Stanley, senior executives. From these, uh, from these banks. Uh, do they know anything about due diligence? Do they know something about assessing a, a financial investment? Of course they do. And still they invested millions of dollars of their personal money and lost it all. How could that be? Well, only thing that makes sense to me is they could not possibly have done any due diligence. 
They could not possibly have worried about any of this because they felt this connection, this attachment, this trust. Okay, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, that's uh, Matthew Broderick, perhaps not the Matthew Broderick you're familiar with, uh, um, but it is uh, unrelated, Matthew Broderick. He is, actually was, uh, the director of the Operations Center at the Department of Homeland Security during the time period of Hurricane Katrina. His job was to monitor, uh, was to monitor all information that was coming in during Hurricane Katrina and make an assessment and a recommendation to the federal government, actually to the White House, on whether the federal government should be much more proactive in dealing with um, the problem and dealing with this disaster. That was his job. So again, he had, his job was to monitor all the information that was going on on the ground and all around Katrina and then make a recommendation to Secretary Chertoff at that time and by implication then President Bush and, and recommend to them that the federal government had to be much more energetic, much more proactive in addressing this, uh, this disaster as opposed to adopting a wait and see approach. That was his primary, his primary job. And, and, and by the way, it wasn't just about Katrina. He was responsible for uh, any major domestic disaster, or whether it's terrorist or whether it's a natural disaster. That was his, that was his job to monitor, uh, to monitor all of that. Um, And in fact, Hurricane Katrina was one of 15 major disasters that were identified by the Department of Homeland Security as the most likely, uh, not most likely, but most dangerous and most damaging uh, things that could, that could happen. Um, so, um, and, and by the way, who is, who, who is Matthew Broderick? Let's, let's be clear on, on the talent and the experience of this person. He was, uh, is, a four-star uh, retired Marine uh, general. Uh, he was in Darfur, he was in uh, Bosnia. Uh, as a young Marine, he was on the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy in Vietnam when those helicopters were taking off. Uh, we're talking about someone with tremendous experience, tremendous skill set, and frankly, we should all feel personal debt of gratitude to somebody like Matthew Broderick for what he's done, what he's accomplished in his career. And by citing him here in this example, it is not meant at all to denigrate the amazing things that he's contributed to, to this country. And in fact, one other thing to keep in mind, while I'm focusing on one person as the key leader in this situation because the purpose is to be able to show how decisions and decision making can be flawed and what you can do about that, the reality is in Katrina, it's a much more complicated story. There were systemic failures, there were state and local government failures as well. So um, let's uh, do a little reminder of what this looked like. It's really an amazing satellite photo. That's the hurricane approaching, uh, approaching New Orleans. And, uh, and then the timeline. And uh, so if we go back to Friday evening, FEMA highlights a concern, New Orleans below sea level. Now, I, I, I'm not quite sure why they decided to highlight that concern because New Orleans did not become below sea level in the days before Katrina. Uh, but that's nonetheless what they thought was important. Um, hurricane hits Monday morning. Very quickly, there are reports of the levees that are breaching. By Monday evening, Broderick issues his report to Secretary Chertoff. The levees have not breached, and he goes on. During the day, he's collected a lot of data, a lot of information, and that is his conclusion. Overnight, of course, more information is coming in, lots of issues, lots of concerns, and overnight, as that information is brought in, at by 6 a.m. the next morning, his staff that's in the office issues a report directly to, to Chertoff, multiple breaches, the downtown is flooded. It turns out Broderick only discovers that report as he drives into Washington, D.C., where his office was, uh, from the suburbs. And he's listening to NPR in the morning, and he hears this report. And he gets into the office, and he's very upset because it looks to him as if his staff has overruled him. And uh, he quickly looks through some of the data and then sends a quick email to Chertoff, and he says, well, that report earlier this morning, we, we may have just exaggerated that a little bit. So hold up. During the day, he continues to collect more data, more information. At this point, by the way, all of us are watching this on TV, and we, we don't need a flood of data coming in. We know what's going, we know what's going on. Uh, nonetheless, more data is coming in, and finally, at 2.30 in the afternoon, Broderick confirms to the White House the levees have breached, and now the federal government needs to be much more proactive. Obviously, it is much, much too late in the situation to, do, to, to really be effective 
in any proactive sense at this stage of the game. Um, and, 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 and you know, a lot of things, a lot of things happen. Let's break this situation down and illustrate all four of these red flag questions to give you an example or two of how some of this may have played in. And also keep in mind, if we knew about these four red flags, if we, if we understood what could go wrong in decisions, what could we have done before Katrina hit to reduce the odds of these things happening? That's pretty important to keep in mind. First of all, Broderick knew very little about New Orleans. He didn't know that the Superdome and the Convention Center were actually different places. Um, he didn't realize how important the levees really were. Uh, he made an early judgment that Florida hurricanes were actually pretty much the same as a New Orleans hurricane. And what that, um, uh, what that disregards is some really important things. Obviously, as I said before, most of New Orleans is below sea level, and most of Florida is not. Obviously, that's going to have a huge impact for a, major, uh, for a major hurricane. But there's also differences in socioeconomic background. There's differences in, with respect to the experience people have with, uh, with hurricanes. And then, you know, we talked about this, this fog of war. Don't act until you know. And by the way, we know a lot about what Broderick said and what he thought because he testified at length to Congress afterwards. So there's a long congressional testimony that we, could, we were able to go through that gave us a lot of insight into his thinking. And when he was asked about his experience, he actually said, I've been there and I've done that. I mean, that's a direct quote of what he said. And remember what I said he had done. He had been in Darfur and Bosnia and all the rest. It, he had done a tremendous number of things. But is that experience base? In military conflicts, wars, the right type of experience base that adds real insight when you have a civilian situation here in New Orleans, a situation where um, you have a disaster situation where people can't fend for themselves, where, the, where it's not a military situation. Uh, clearly, these experience bases were, the experience base was fundamentally different, probably over, uh, overestimated. Um, secondly, so by the way, I, 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 I was saying, what could you have done ahead of time if you had thought through some of this? Well, clearly more research about New Orleans could have been done, and he and his staff should have had a lot better, deeper understanding of the situation and the fact that Florida hurricanes are not the same as New Orleans hurricanes. There could have been some discussions about the type of experience and the type of situation in this type, in, in a hurricane uh, scenario, and, and what the differences are and how and the differences between civilian and military. And actually, if we, if, we, if we sat down and thought about this, we probably can each come up with a dozen different things we may have wanted to talk about ahead of time. Second, self-interest for Broderick. Uh, perhaps he didn't want to look bad passing that information to the White House, passing bad information or inaccurate information to the White House. And so he wanted to wait until he personally was virtually 100% certain that he had it right. And you know, this turf battle got a lot of publicity. Michael Brown from FEMA, he was on CNN live with, with, with Larry King talking about this. And uh, the problem happened there, it, the problem that happened there is that Michael Brown used to report directly to Secretary Chertoff. And in fact, through the reorganization and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, he reported directly to, um, um, to, to Broderick. And he didn't like that. And he tried to go over, over his head. Uh, prejudgment. Remember what I said about prejudgment. You make a quick, early decision, and you stick to it no matter what. What was the early decision? Katrina would be a quote unquote normal hurricane, somewhat like Florida hurricane. It wouldn't create this type of damage. Uh, it wouldn't create this type of problem. And he makes this prejudgment. And what do you do when you make a prejudgment? Two things, right? You look for data that confirms that prejudgment, and you discount data that is inconsistent with that prejudgment. So Broderick testified to Congress that he had a, a monitor, TV monitor on in his office. And he had CNN on. And he's watching CNN. And he, and he, and he says in response to a question from a uh, congressman, uh, I was watching CNN, and they were showing uh, people in the French Quarter dancing and partying and drinking on the streets and having a great time and talking about, talking about how they dodged a bullet. And he actually said to, Congre to the congressman, what did you expect me to think? Now, it turns out that the French Quarter is one of the few places within New Orleans that is not below sea level, but above sea level. That's a fact that one would think should have been, should have been known. But maybe more important, there were dozens, hundreds of other data points coming in throughout the day and days, indicating 
holes in the levees, levees were breaching, problems were occurring, superdome overcrowding, uh, convention center problems, lots of other data was coming in, but he disregarded or discounted that data in favor of the data from CNN, of all places. And why? Well, I think to some extent, this prejudgment in action. We do this all the time. Finally, attachments for Broderick. Uh, certainly an attachment to the Marines, and I've already spoken about the great service um, and respect uh, for, for, what he's, uh, for what he's done. But he also didn't trust other sources of data nearly as much as he trusted military sources of data. And you know, actually, uh, the thing that finally triggered uh, Broderick to say, you know, we, we have, we, we've passed the limit, we need to be much more pro proactive, was that an army colonel commandeered a helicopter and flew directly over, the, um, directly over the levees and reported to Broderick. He was on the phone with Broderick while he was flying over there saying, the levees are breached, I could see with my own eyes. It was only at that point with that first-hand data from a highly trusted source that he finally notified Chertoff that, yes, the levees are breached and we have this, have this problem. So all of these things are questions, fundamental questions, that I think in any important decision are things that could help us and can hurt us. And if you think about this, you take it all together and kind of bring us towards a, a wrap-up, uh, what do we know? We know that people make decisions on the basis of emotions much more so then maybe we give it credit. Again, I'm confident that if any of us just kind of sat back and thought about this for a minute, that should sound obvious to us. Of course, emotions play a role. But somehow in the business world, we forget about some of the basic human nature and, and frailties and biases that exist, and we all of a sudden believe we don't, we don't, we don't let our emotions play a role. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's simply not consistent with now overwhelming research. Red flag conditions, these four questions, what are they? They're just early warning signs, right? It doesn't mean disaster will strike. It doesn't mean that. It just means an early warning sign means pay more attention. It really means identify some safeguards that can reduce our vulnerability to maybe making some of these big decision-making mistakes. And these safeguards, and this is the good news in the whole story, these safeguards are not complicated. Safeguards involve making sure you have real debate and discussion, having people in the room that are gonna push back against you, ensuring you have experts that are part of the discussion when you're dealing with a complex situation. Uh, they involve monitoring decisions carefully. They involve careful oversight. Uh, the reality is that there are dozens and dozens of things that we can do by way of safeguard. This is not rocket science by any means. The much more difficult problem is recognizing, maybe being willing, and then actually recognizing that you have some of these decision-making red flags in place. The much easier thing, believe it or not, is installing these safeguards. In fact, in my, in my book, I have a long list of, of um, in the appendix, a checklist of all sorts of things you can do. You know, devil's, a, devil's advocate, uh, um, uh, scenario planning, simulations, wargaming. There's dozens and dozens of things, tools, that people have developed, some common sense, some a little more sophisticated, that people have developed over the years. The problem is not knowing what to do about this. The problem is being able to recognize when you, need to, when you need to do that. Because in fact, I think all important decisions should have a red flags type of discussion, type of analysis. And when you identify, when you, when you assess that you know, none of these real red flags are in place, doesn't look too bad, then why slow yourself down with all kinds of bureaucracy and complicated you know, decision planning? Uh, I'm not a fan of any of that stuff. I think if, if, if you have enough evidence that says we're not falling into these four red flag traps, then why not move quickly? It's only when they exist that you take this step back, this step back and, 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 and you, you, you think again about this. And by the way, this is not a complicated thing to do. It's not even more complicated than writing down on, on an index card these four red flags. And next time you're involved in, uh, oops, there we go, in an important decision, uh, take 10 minutes, that's not a big investment, and start to ask these questions. You may decide you want to spend more than 10 minutes, but it's a start. Final point, final point. Uh, because a number of these, these uh, biases and these red flags operate at a subconscious level, is a real challenge. I'm not saying this is easy to do to identify that you have this, th these, these issues, but the way that you do it really involves two different mechanisms. One is the safeguards that we've talked about and that I mentioned, you know, I've got these checklists, so there's a lot we can do there. But the other one is a little bit more personal and it's about self-awareness. It's about self-monitoring. 
It's about understanding who you are and what you're good at and what you're not good at. It's about looking for, as often as possible, quick feedback on what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, and, you know, every, or almost every company, or many companies, let's say, do 360 degree feedback uh, and evaluation and assessment. Those are really valuable. Uh, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about you're in a meeting and the meeting's, gone, the meeting's done as you're walking down the hallway with a colleague. Ask that colleague, what should I have done better? Did we really get to the result you think we should have? And if that person can't respond right away, a cup of coffee later in the day could do it as well. Now, none of that happens if you don't have people that are willing and able to say what it is they're thinking. So that's also a critical, critical component. So look for opportunities as a mixed group of MBA students and, and experienced executives and others that are here. So for every single person, look for opportunities to, uh, to, to understand yourself better, your strengths and your weaknesses, to assess what you're good at, to be more aware of what you're doing in real time so you can, you can step in. It's, it, it hopefully is a very positive message about what, about what you can do. Thank you very much.